Hi, I'm Max Kaiser, and welcome once again to On the Edge, coming to you from sunny downtown Tehran, Iran. Let's go to London to talk with Thomas C. Mountain. Thomas is an independent journalist living in Eritrea and writes often on the Horn of Africa. Thomas, welcome to the Edge. Thanks, Max. Nice to be back. All righty. Thomas C. Mountain, you are an expert on the Horn of Africa. So your thoughts on the recent WikiLeaks Cablegate revelations that the U.S. essentially hired Ethiopian President Meles Sinawi, I'm probably saying that incorrectly, to invade Somalia in 2006. Well, I haven't had a chance to really review all 1,300 and some documents. Um, it's pretty much common knowledge that Meles was sent in and I don't think he was too happy about it because in history, no Ethiopian regime has ever picked a fight with the Somalis. Uh, there was a war between Somalia and Ethiopia in 1977, but that was started by the Somalis. So I don't think any Ethiopian president in his right mind would volunteer to start a war with Somalia. So I think he pretty much was pressured by his masters that pay his salary and his military budget uh, in the United States. Right. Well, this is what we're seeing with these uh, WikiLeaks uh, revelations is the U.S. just basically interfering all over the world extra legally, no due process, no consideration for uh, the law, uh, no consideration for human rights or civil rights, and they're just making a mess wherever they go. But uh, the cables also show Blackwater pitching in to get involved in Somalia. Uh, what's, the what's the empire's interest in Somalia? Do they have any oil? Well, yeah, there's supposed to be a lot of oil and gas, but I think it's more of a, just a, in general, the Americans' uh, foreign policy, particularly in regards to Africa, is what we call crisis management. They want to instigate a crisis and then, they, then manage the crisis so that basically they, they can prevent any strong nationalist government from coming to power that would protect the people's interests, which would force the Western uh, governments to pay a fair share for their natural resources, Basically, they just want to be able to come in and pay off some warlords and rape and loot the resources of the country whenever possible. And I think that's pretty much U.S. policy in Somalia. They know that the Somali, if the, a genuine nationalist government comes into power in Somalia, they're going to be pretty hostile to Western interests, especially the United States, because the U.S. has committed a long list of very nasty crimes in Somalia. So they just want to see the warlords in power. And... When the Union of Islamic Courts came to power, brought peace to Mogadishu for the first time in, end of, in 2006, the Americans sent the Ethiopi their Ethiopian gendarmes or their policemen on the beat in to destroy that peace. So um, I don't think uh, the U.S. has any good intentions towards Somalia at all. But tell me something about Somalia. I heard, uh, you can you know, help me pick through this, whether this is all nonsense or not, but I heard that in Somalia, Coca-Cola has these huge tankers parked outside um, that are filled with Coke syrup. It's the largest distribution point for Coke syrup, and effectively Coke syrup is the currency of Somalia. Is that crazy or is that somewhere near accurate? I, that's the first I've heard of that. I mean, the Somali pirates, of course, have collected about $500 million and more uh, hijacking ships. And there's been a lot of talk about, oh, they're trying to defend their fishing rights and other things. But the bottom line is, you've got a lot of ships presently hijacked in Somalia, and the pirates there are basically working for the warlords. The pirates capture a ship, they have to pay off the local warlord, they have to pay off the district warlord, they have to pay off the presidential warlord, they have to pay off the Ethiopian military, and they have to, of course, pay off Melisanawi in Addis Ababa. And in exchange for that, they get protection. The Ethiopian uh, regime is the U.S. policeman on the beat. They pretty much told the United States and all the Western countries to lay off the Somali pirates because they're paying protection money. And that explains why there hasn't been a single cruise missile come whistling through the doors of any of these pirate lairs after they've collected their loot. And that's something that no one in the Western media wants to talk about, is how come there has been zero retaliation against these pirates. Okay. The Americans have bombed how, how, how much are you saying? 500 million, you say? Over 500 million, yes. Okay, and so you're, you're positing that the, uh, essentially the American pirates, the Wall Street banks, are somehow involved in taking a cut of that, and it's easy money for them, 
And of course, you would never go in there and disrupt easy money. There's a stock exchange that sprung up around the piracy that's going on. Real estate prices are exploding. So it's like the Hamptons. You got the crooks and the pirates on Wall Street and the real estate market in the Hamptons goes up. Here in Somalia, you've got pirates out there, 500 million or so looting. And the real estate market around that area goes up. And you've got the same, same crooks, the same financial terrorists, the overlord financial ter terrorists, J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Warren Buffett, etc., in there taking a cut. Now, what's the mechanism for them to take the cut? I mean, it's not the IMF. They're not the intermediary uh, disruptive terrorist force. It's not the World Bank. What's the intermediary force that does the, uh, that, that, you know, holds the bag, the bag man for, for the uh, Wall Street banks in Somalia? Well, um, the, you know, like the American foreign policy is based on using a local policeman on the beat. And um, Mela Sanawi is the one that the, most of the money ends up in his pocket. Um, he has his warlords in Puntland, where most of the pirates come from, and Puntland is located right on the very tip of the Horn of Africa. So there's a payoff that starts with the, you know, some desperados going out in small open boats and snatching these ships and collecting cash. And they land on the, on the beach, and, and oftentimes they head right for the nearest Ethiopian military base to make their payoff to make sure that no one comes in and bombs them in their homes. So in any case, uh, Mela Sanawi is the bag man. Okay, but who who's the banking facility here? Is it the Swiss banks? Is it, I heard Tel Aviv now is a huge money laundering operation, kind of picking up the slack from Switzerland. I mean, who, where's the banking money laundering, the main money laundering going on for this particular global scam? Well, you know, the, Ethiopia is the center of, of an enormous uh, aid to arms diversion scandal. I mean, uh, something like $6 billion a year, according to the latest reports I've seen, is funneled to the Melisinawi regime to keep him in power there and enforce the, you know, the interests of the IMF and the World Bank in that part of the world. So I think it's pretty much they pay off Melisinawi and he does, does what they want him to, like invade Somalia, invade Eritrea, where I lived 10 years ago. So I mean, I think it's um, right now Melisinawi is carrying out a genocide in the Ogaden and uh, what's, uh, it's, a, it's escalating into a full-blown genocide where he's rounding up uh, tens of thousands of uh, ethnic Somalis in the Ethiopian Ogaden and putting them into basically starvation camps. To, you know, the expression is, if you can't catch the fish, meaning the Ogaden rebels, you drain the lake. And that's what he's doing. He's uh, accelerating the Ogaden genocide. And the purpose of all that is just basically to keep Mela Sinawi in power so he can protect imperial American interests or Pax Americana in the Horn of Africa, which is one of the most strategic areas in the world. All the trade between Asia and Europe passes through the Horn of Africa every day. So the Americans have got Mela Sinawi there, protecting the bank's interests, protecting the interests of the financial terrorists. And he's the guy that's got the huge bank accounts in, in London, in hundreds of millions of dollars. And this has been going on for decades. Okay, so that kind of gets toward what I was asking about. So Mela Sinawi uh, is going through London, not Switzerland or Tel Aviv to launder the money. Six billion dollars a year in arms deals. Of course, arms dealing being uh, America's uh, huge money laundering uh, operation globally. A trillion dollars of tax money collected from those poor schmucks in America every year uh, that goes to the IRS ends up in the Pentagon and then that guns out buying guns uh, for terrorists around the world uh, like this fellow Mela Zanawi who's using billions of dollars in arms deals to launder the money he's stealing vis-a-vis -vis the Somali pirates. I tell you, he should just go public on the New York Stock Exchange. He'd get a better valuation. He could be like the Groupon or the Google of piracy. He could be worth $200 billion instead of just maybe $20 billion. But anyway, let's move on. Um, Blackwater, now known as Z. Uh, let's talk about their involvement a little bit more. Are they visible? Do they wear big branded you know, uniforms like where is Blackwater, Z, the mercenaries for hire? Or are they more you know, underground? Well, I don't think even Blackwater wants to go into Somalia. What they've been doing is they've been using Ugandan proxies and Burundian proxies in Mogadishu to try to prop up this puppet regime that they claim is the government of Somalia. And what they've been doing with these Ugandan and, and Burundian troops who've got the, imp the blessing of the United Nations under the African Union is every time the, the guerrilla fighters attack them successfully, in frustration, they fire artillery rounds into the surrounding civilian neighborhoods. And most people don't realize when you hear reports of deaths in Mogadishu, almost all of that's caused by mortar and artillery rounds fired by United Nations-blessed African Union troops. So there's been 
uh, probably tens of thousands of Somalis killed by the United Nations and the African Union troops in Somalia, who they have the gall to call peacekeepers. All right, now, uh, Thomas Mountain, you live in Africa, where missionaries and charities have operated for centuries as the unarmed wing of the empire. Uh, tell us about the human rights mob. Who are they? Why do they call themselves a mob? Well, I've labeled them the human rights mob because um, George Soros is the financial hitman. George the hitman Soros has just given $1 billion over the next 10 years in a matching grant to Human Rights Watch. Now, this is a matching grant, meaning that through other foundations and trusts, which George Soros has laundered donations to the likes of Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International for years now, he'll give them another billion dollars. So Human Rights Watch is about to collect two billion dollars in the next 10 years from George the Hitman Soros. <laughs> now what's Human Rights Watch going to do with this? Well George Soros got on National Public Radio in the United States and said we're going to send, we're going to expand Human Rights Watch into the developing world. We're going to have offices of Human Rights Watch basically gathering intelligence and influencing public and government uh, policy in the developing world as much as possible towards policies that favor George Soros. Now, why do we call George Soros the hitman? Well, a good example is the Rose Revolution in Georgia, when George Soros put 40, over $42 million through his NGO fronts into supporting the Shashkavili regime. Now, $42 million, that's 10, almost $10 per person in Georgia. Now, that would be like in the United States if George Soros spent $3 billion on the American election, putting Barack Obama into power. And what did he do? Soon as Shaskavili came to power, he started arresting the opposition, he started torturing opposition members, opposition members started disappearing. And on top of that, Shaskavili had his military attack the South Ossetians, who he claims are his own people, opening artillery fire on civilian communities. And it, what kind of massacre would have happened if the Russians hadn't counterattacked and driven him out? And all this was paid for by George Soros putting Shaskavili in power. Now, the, this is blood money now. These, these NGOs that put Chaskavili in power with this $42 million have got blood stains on their hands. And the Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International kept their mouths shut when all this happened. They're quick to jump out and condemn Eritrea for alleged human rights abuses, which are pretty much non-existent. And yet they're quick to, they're very quiet when it comes to uh, a program that George Soros is funding. So I call them, you know, the human rights mob. They're taking the hitman's money and uh, they're attacking countries like Eritrea who are really doing a lot of things to uh, promote human rights, like provide clean drinking water to the people, make sure everybody has fed, that people have a roof over their head, and people have decent medical care. These are really the basic human rights, not uh, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, freedom of elections, which is what Human Rights, and, uh, human rights Watch and Amnesty proclaim so loudly about. You know, so the fact is that uh, basically the human rights movement has been bought off by a financial terrorist by, like George Soros to the tune of $2 billion. $2 billion for Human Rights Watch? It's an incredible amount of money in 10 years. What are they going to do with it? We know what they're going to do with it. They're going to go in and be a front for Soros in, in the third world, in the developing world. But Thomas Mountain, didn't you read The Alchemy of Finance? George Soros says... A uh, masterpiece where he explains reflexivity, which basically says if you manipulate the price of a market enough, it will become the new normal, and then you can cash in on your manipulation and say, oh, it was the market and not me. <laughs> I'll have to read that, Max. Thanks for the tip. <laughs> yeah, it's a how-to guide on how to manipulate markets. And just to be clear, uh, the human rights mob is a label you've given these groups, and you're saying basically they're taking the money from Soros, who has a vested interest in manipulating these markets, and claiming to be somehow uh, a man uh, interested in furthering human rights, but in fact, he's only f interested in furthering his net worth. And uh, he's not really doing well on either side as a hedge fund manager or as a human rights philanthropist. I think he's kind of a, give him a B. But anyway, let's move on to another one of these global, globe-trotting do-gooders that seems to do bad more than good. Bill Gates, multi-billionaire founder of Microsoft. You write, quote, Bill Gates, $10 billion vaccine scam, end quote. Uh, I take it you don't find his charitable work in Africa very charitable, Thomas Mountain. Yes, well, I'll give you an example. I live in Eritrea, which has reduced malaria mortality in the last eight years by almost 85%. 
Now, malaria is the number one killer in Africa, and this has been the biggest breakthrough in history in uh, fighting malaria mortality. And it's not a medicine-based program.